Thank you for for the invitation. I'm, I'm sorry I, I couldn't come because I mean, I'm in Paris for another conference this week. So I will so try to give an overview of various problems. And I will start with the uh, waste double Hurwitz numbers. And so the weight double Hurwitz numbers, so you consider, so Hurwitz numbers, you want to count the number of branch covers of P1 with some control ramifications. So here is P1, so special point zero and infinity. And, and uh, so I hear a echo of my voice. I don't know if that's normal. Yeah, I'm not sure how, can we turn off our microphone? Can you still keep? Yeah, now, now we can, uh, okay. No, I don't hear anymore. Okay, no, so uh, just, yeah, I think go ahead. We are going okay. to mute ourselves, so you shouldn't hear any echo. Just let us know. Yeah. Um, so we are considering branch covers of P1, and in particular, over two points. So this can, um, there can be various sheets, and there's some replication above. So this should be above zero. And above infinity, it does something else. For example, this. So this is a branch cover of degree. So in general, you want something of degree D. Um, and here above zero, you see that there's some ramification. So you can encode that into the length, I mean, the length of rows of a partition. So here the read the partition would be this one. And on the other side, I will have this partition. And um, you may also have, so let me add another thing. You may also have ramification somewhere else. So you may have some other ramification points here. And when you consider double Hurwitz numbers, uh, you want to control the ramification above zero and infinity. So we call that lambda and mu. And for the other ramification points, you will rather put uh, some random ramification profile. And random here in a bit generalized sense because you're just going to weights, and the weights may not be positive. And this is encoded into an element B, which I want to see as a linear combination of uh, cycle types. And um, that is an element of the center of the symmetric group algebra of sigma d. So it's a combination of C lambda. C. That's the class corresponding to the sum of all permutations that are in a given conjugacy class whose length of cycles are given by the size of the rows of lambda. And there may be some coefficients. <clears throat> and if you want to count the number of branch covers with that type of replication data, uh, so this is something that goes back to, to Hurwitz, uh, you can actually, so I'm going to call this number of such branch cover H lambda mu b. You can express it in terms of representation theory of the symmetric group. In particular, what you're going to, to do here, so up to normalization, um, you're going to multiply C lambda B and C mu and uh, take the coefficient of the identity in this product. And this is living in the center of the symmetric group algebra. And this is because when you look at P1 minus the branch points and uh, so the branch cover uh, of two isomorphism determined by the um, which representation of pi one, uh, you have and the pi one is as a presentation of the product of the cycles which goes around this point is equal to the identity. So there's various types of Hurwitz number you can consider. So that's what the the weight part is. This is about this b. Um, so there's something called simple. If you only allow simple branch points for these extra points, um, that would correspond to take b which is one over k factorial if you have k of them. And then, so uh, the permutations correspond to how is the local monodromy? Uh, so how the sheets are permuted. If you have simple branch points, you should have transpositions. And so the contribution 
of all these points here, these red points is going to be a product of transpositions. And since you don't want to label this point, you divide by one over k factorial. But you can consider many other types of ways, and that's uh, something that uh, John uh, studied a lot. Um, in particular, there's something I will call uh, B strictly, and then some um, gamma, which is the sum over k. So k would be, again, the number of these points. Gamma is a parameter to make a generating series. And here I want to take the elementary, um, or let's say for the moment, I still want to take a product of transpositions. However, you so that would correspond to a strictly monotone, which is this funny condition that, okay, so when you have a transposition, it's uh, A, I, B, I, and you can always assume that A, I is smaller than B, I, and a strictly monotone, will mean that uh, you want that the bi is, is strictly increasing. And you can also consider the weekly monotone. So here it's uh, max, what I will call this bi, I call it max of tau i, and it should be strictly increasing. And here I want the same with a weekly increasing sequence of transpositions. <laughs> So there are three particular examples. There are many others which are which are interesting, but this one will play an important role in my talk. Uh, Gaetan. Yes. The, the gamma is just a parameter, and that's powers, right? Gamma is just a parameter. Okay. So there's a second aspect to this, and this is something, in fact, I learned from uh, directly from discussion with John. When I visited Montreal, I think around 2015, when I was working on this with uh, Mathieu Guépaquet, um, is that there are three descriptions of this. So you want to consider this space, which is the center of the symmetry group. And uh, as a vector space, I mean, this has three descriptions. It's also the space of the ring of symmetric functions. So the isomorphism is the vector space. So symmetric function with countably many variables. And it's also the fermionic Fox space. So the semi-infinite wedge. But from the, each of these three descriptions, you can learn uh, a lot on the others because, for example, over here, this is a ring, while here, um, it's not obviously so. Uh, it is not the same structure. Uh, you have certain group actions here that you can transport to the other side. And this Fox space is also something which is a, at the heart of uh, two D two D hierarchy, it's an integrable hierarchy. So here, if I take um, the power sums attached to a certain Young diagram lambda, and one normalized by a symmetry factor, the isomorphism just sending this to the conjugacy class. Then there's a particular action one want to consider is the so the regular um, action here, I mean, after all, this is a, a group algebra, it's commutative one because it's in the center. So you have the regular action on itself. And it's interesting to look at the Juicy's Murphy's elements. So J, J, which is the sum of all transposition with maximum index J. And these are not in the center. However, if you take any, so let me give a name lambda to this ring of symmetric function. If you take any symmetric polynomial, you can evaluate it on the Drusy's Murphy, and then at some point you put zeros. And that happens to actually um, generate the center. So you can take such an element and, and then multiply, act on this on C lambda or transport this action to act on the ring of symmetric function. Um, so one interesting property of, of this, so I'm going to call that Rj, not writing the zeros. Um, when you act, so not on the 
power sum, but on the sure basis, which on this side correspond to the eigenpotents. In fact, the sure uh, functions are eigenvectors for this action. And here you see uh, the polynomial R applied to the content of lambda, which is the set of all. So you have a Young diagram, there's a row and a column position and the set of all A minus I minus J for a box in lambda. And that's eigenvalue. On the other hand, if you come back from how these Justice Murphy's elements are defined and uh, put into uh, some polynomial, you would see that this is acting, if I call that BR, um, I could take that as my intermediate ramification profile. And you can try to um, see how is that acting on uh, the conjugacy class on the power sums. And so I probably don't uh, count on me for uh, all the for all the factors to be right in this talk. It's probably some symmetry factor which are off. But um, here you would see that you get the sum of exactly these double Hurwitz numbers with intermediate ramification profile BR. And then it's going to be a P mu divided by automorphism of mu. <clears throat> so in particular, if you want um, to have these simple branch points, um, you would take P1, so as um, so P1 of J to the K over K factorial. If you want B, um, so the, the strictly monotone Hurwitz numbers, so before we had this elementary symmetry, well, we had this. If you look at what it means in terms of the, the J's, it corresponds to the elementary symmetrics. And so this should be this product. And on the other hand, if you want the weekly monotone, you will get the HKs which are those ones. Um, sorry, I think I probably I mixed them. Uh, this here. Probably vice versa. Yes, this one is like that. While you get the H if you do this. So some of the inverse, these two operators up to a chain flipping on the sign of gamma, they're, uh, they're inverse to each other. Good. And so what I learned from, from John is that, so there's the trivial, there's a 2D Toda tau function, uh, which is something which live in lambda, so a completion of the double tensor product. Uh, <clears throat> and there's a trivial tau function, which is the sum of S lambda tensor S lambda. So you can imagine it's expressed in terms of symmetric polynomials in two sets of countably many variables. And then you can act on this by Rj on the first factor, identity on the second factor. And you still get, so what John calls a hypergeometric tau function. And because S lambdas are eigenvectors, it has a very simple form, it's still diagonal. However, the interesting point is that the common aspects of Drusy's Murphy tell you that actually it's also a generating series of Hurwitz numbers when you express this in terms of power sums. Now, unless there are questions, I, I will move to uh, discussing the relation with uh, the topological recursion. Gaetan may I ask a short question. Yes. Yes, hi. Uh, so uh, actually something that I was afraid to ask for a long time. Uh, this uh, with tau functions, they are, are they related to what is called descendant form when we have ramification profiles at three, at fixed number of points? 
I think uh, you can express certain this and of found generating series with certain operators B. Correspond to a particular choice of B, if I remember. Mm, particular choice, but not any choice. Not any choice. Mm -hmm. So it's a generalization, I... excuse me, it's a generalization of descent enfant, but descent enfant is a particular case. Okay. So if you, for a long time, people only considered simple Hurwitz numbers, which means you, so it doesn't have to do with the intermediate points, it's just that you, you pick the trivial amputation of our infinity. And there was a conjecture coming from, uh, from string theory, the bouchard marvinio conjecture, which exploits the relation between, I mean, Hurwitz numbers can be realized a certain limit of topological strings. Um, and the bouchard marvinio conjecture stated that if you apply topological recursion TR on, on this curve, um, then you actually get the, so maybe I call, so there's the simple Hurwitz numbers. You can extract the simple Hurwitz numbers so with this trivial ratification here. Um, and by now, so this was around 2000 and Eight, and by now this has uh, three different, at least I know three different proofs. So it's a well understood thing, but that was the, the starting point. So it's conjecture and then it's first proof. And then there were various generalizations of this where um, people started to realize that if you put another type of way, so another B, then you still get topological recursion. Um, so more and more families that was 10 years ago of simple, but waste Hurwitz numbers were shown first conjecture and then shown to satisfy topological recursion. And uh, the spectral curve, so I should maybe say it's a recursion on what? Here, from this stage, you actually, you're not totally satisfied with counting just branch covers. You want to fix their topology. So you want to fix the genus and fix the length. So what's the number of premages of zero in the branch cover? And you're doing connected branch covers. So you have a certain genus G and it's a recursion on two G minus two plus N. And the spectral curve, so y is a function of x. In each of these problems, so that's the easy part because you just need to, to find the case um, g equals zero, n equals one, and very often you can compute that by elementary means. <coughs> so in most of these problems, you could actually compute what the spectral curve should be. And then the question was, can you prove topological recursion? And a lot of people worked on this and managed to prove that in several cases. Each time the method was a bit more technical, so it was a case by case thing. Um, then there was a, a work by a uh, series of work by Alexandro, so by John with Alexandrov, Chapuis, and Enar, who uh, I think were the first to tackle this problem, but for uh, to try with double Hurwitz numbers. And um, here there's a, a nice idea because now you have two sets of parameters. So what do you recurse on? Um, they desymmetrize the treatment of the two points. So more precisely what they're going to do. So you want to define some omega GNs, which you want to compute. And uh, this is going to be, so there's a sum over all the ramification uh, when you have exactly n primages above zero. Um, so here you're going to put x lambda one, x n lambda n. And here the lambdas are not ordered. And here you want to put your, let's call that b, a lambda and mu. And uh, so what do you do with the mu? So these you represent as variables. 
but for the muse, you just put some parameters. So it's Q um, mu one, Q mu L mu over automorphism of mu. And this one you treat as parameters, not as variables. And uh, you probably want to do something like this. And what they managed to prove is that at least when B is of the form Rj with an R polynomial, and there was a, a few more assumptions, but that's the essential one, then indeed uh, you get topological recursion for these things. And so you get a spectral curve depending. So it was the first case where you actually families of wave Hurwitz numbers that were satisfying topological recursion. Um, and this assumption was technically important from them. The proof was not working without it uh, for good reasons. And, and so it fell, it fell short of proving it TR for, let's say, simple branch points, I mean, arbitrarily many simple branch points, which would correspond to take R, which is exponential of some gamma P1. Because then the R of J would actually be the sum over, ga over K, um, gamma to the K, and then product of K transpositions arbitrary with a K factorial. So it cannot do this case, which is a bit of a pity. Um, but then there were other approach uh, on this problem, which uh, was uh, some building also on, on this work. Um, in general for this service problem. So it was maybe the merging of, of ideas coming from this work and ideas that were existing before, which was really exploiting the Fox space uh, description of Hurwitz numbers. So it's another approach which was developed by the group of Shadrin in Amsterdam. So there's William Bakowski, Shadrin, and many others, Levansky, um, et cetera. Um, and so they really use Fox Peck expressions, which is secretly, um, which is exploiting. So this fact that, okay, so we started with something in this description of the Fox space, and we bring it to the fermionic Fox space. And here there's a nice operator you can express in terms of the Clifford algebra acting on that. And uh, you use these sort of operator or expressions to get two things. So the general strategy was, you can always get cut and join equations. This is not hard with these operator formalisms. And the hard part is you can try to prove that these generating series, which are just formal series in the Xs, actually have an analytic continuation on the spectral curve of the problem. And that for a long time was pretty hard. So people, that's why people tackle case by case, each time being more ingenious with the, with the algebra. Um, and together, these two things imply the so-called loop equations, which are equations which are directly solved by TR. So at this point, uh, we tried. So this was a work with um, so Do Levansky. Um, so Karev and uh, Elena Moskovsky. Um, so we try to adapt those techniques um, to take to tackle this case. And this was much more technical, but we we succeeded. Um, and so it gives um, so it is for that case, uh, you get TR. It's around the year. I think it was finished during the early COVID times. Um, you get TR for that spectral curve. So you write it, you get it in parameterized form. So here are the Qs, which encode how it behaves at, uh, you know, the branch curve behave at infinity. You truncate it somewhere, but you can put this truncation arbitrarily large. And here you have the same polynomial. 
And shortly after, in fact, uh, Mishkov, uh, Kazarian, Dunin Barkovsky, and uh, Shadrin, in fact, managed to completely systematize that analysis. So they made it systematic by using operator manipulation in the Fox space. So it's a, it's a beautiful word because automatically they could derive TR for the largest class possible of weight Hurwitz, double Hurwitz numbers. And some of this closes a bit, the, this problem opened almost 15 years ago. And not only close the problem, but it allows to, to tackle other problems. And uh, now I want to, to come to this. This is an operator method. So this brings me to a third topic, which is matrix models and free probabilities. Um, and here, I want to recall a bit the, the history, I mean, um, of, of these recent developments. Um, in the year 2001, so one knows that two matrix models, so two Hermitian matrix models, with a measure of this form, you have two potential for the matrices, and then they're coupled with trace of M1 and M2. Um, they can be solved by bi-orthogonal polynomials. And um, as much as orthogonal polynomials, it's well known to satisfy a second order differential equation, uh, by orthogonal polynomials also satisfy um, differential equations. And you can also change the coefficient of the potential. So um, you're in fact compatible ODEs. But now you have two types of polynomials. So you get two lax pair, two lax pair descriptions for the two uh, polynomials. And um, in 2001, Marco, Bertrandina, and John made the observation that the spectral curve of these lax pairs, so I call it L1, were dual, I mean, were essentially the same. Also, the lax pairs have different size. Uh, they're quite different, L1 and L2 as operators, but uh, the spectral curve is the and uh, shortly after, building on, on works on matrix models uh, that were uh, happening at the, uh, in the early 90s, uh, Chekhov and Alain Orantin, in fact, systematized solving the large and expansion of these matrix models once you assume it exists. And that gave rise to the theory of topological recursion. The theory was invented to solve matrix models for uh, large and expansions. And it was working for the one Hermitian matrix model, but also for the two Hermitian matrix model. And it's topological recursion. So it's, it's a recursion again on GNN for these quantities, which are the coefficient of, uh, so the large and asymptotic expansion of the cumulants of the resolvent of the matrices. In the one matrix model, it would be this. So it's for those objects here. And once you know these correlators, these correlators, you can get back to the free energy by a sort of integration. But in the two matrix model, you have two matrices and there's TR for the correlators of each of the matrix. So in Vapri, you have two ways of getting the free energy. Um, this led uh, Enar to propose um, so there was two ways, and so another envision that actually that, so it should of course give rise to the same free energies, getting it from the two spectral curve, and the two spectral curves are related by some sort of kind of exchange of the whole of X and Y. So that exchange of X and Y uh, should give the same free energies in general in topological recursion. And he called that the symplectic invariance. So also the correlators are very different if you exchange X and Y, because you can think in the two matrix models, correlators of one matrix and correlators of another matrix. 
the free energies, which are the some of the omega G zero, are the same. So formulating this precisely and even trying to prove it is, is quite tricky. And um, there was some argument of based on the analysis of the two matrix model, which was not, which was pretty involved. And, and um, uh, yes, is there a question? No, no, no. no. So I was looking for, uh, a simple, a simpler way to understand this duality. In particular, we know that matrix models, uh, matrix integrals are generating series for maps, so for ribbon graphs. And I was trying to understand uh, what does that mean in terms of uh, of maps. So I looked for a combinatorial interpretation of the symplectic invariants. Or at least, if not the symplectic invariance, so that's still not realized, of the x and y exchange. And in fact, there is something which is known where this x and y exchange appears in a bit of a disguised form, which is in free probability. So in free probability, which is something which was introduced by Volculescu. So there's a Volculescu R transform. And it tells that if you have a sequence MK, which you would call the moments, you can construct from it what we call so the free cumulants, um, kappa K. And I will not exactly write the way Voskulisko wrote it. I will write it in a way which is convenient for us. So you make this generating series. The relation actually becomes nicer in this way. So with m0 equal 1, and here again, kappa 0 is going to be equal to 1. So you make this generating series, and then you make these other generating series. So here it's in terms of 1 over x, and here it's in terms of uh, w. And so there's a certain definition I mean, from Voskulescu, and essentially term, and this definition amounts to say that x of wx is equal to little x. So if you call uh, y equal w of x, then you realize that um, x is uh, bx of y is a functional inverse. So that's an example of xy exchange. And in the context of a matrix model, so here let me say um, maybe what these moments correspond to if you have on the space Hn of Hermitian matrices of size n, you take a probability measure, which is Un invariant by Un conjugation. For example, something expressed in terms of traces. Um, you can look, so Mk, <clears throat> you can try to look at the large n limit of the trace of Mk, m is my matrix and Assuming that this sort of limit exists, that will define your moments. And um, then the free cumulants also have an expression. I'm going to come to that. And in terms of maps, this is counting. So if you have a model which is here, which is a perturbation of the GUE, it is going to have a so when P is a formal perturbation of the Gaussian measure, this MK uh, first exists and then is counting disks, so maps with the topology of a disk of perimeter K. And we found, we, we, I consider the following problem. So maps, it's uh, you have various faces that you glue together and there's a, um, so it's a graph on the surface. There's a boundary, here's a topology of a disk and this has length K. But in the way these things are defined, I mean, the, the Feynman graph for these matrix models, and they actually, these maps can be pretty singular. So you can have some, actually some bubbles, bubblings here. Okay. 
So you could say, well, I try to express these genetic signal maps in terms of simple, simpler maps. So we call uh, fully simple maps. And we found that Kappa K uh, counts fully simple maps, which are those without touching. So this core, for example, is simple. And it's expressed by internal generating series by this relation. So the other thing we know is that topological recursion computes because it applies to matrix models, it also applies to enumeration of maps. So it computes the omega gen, which are uh, counting maps of genus G with n boundaries. And to be precise, the topological recursion, so the, the spectral curve is this W of X genetic series of ordinary, so this one we call ordinary disks. So that this counting, and then you also need an input, which is um, omega zero two, which you slightly shift to form an object called the Bergman kernel. And so these, as an analytic condition on a certain curve, which is the spectral curve, you take the function X, the variable x, then you express y in terms of x, and you apply b, and you apply tr, and you obtain the omega g x. That's the result of essentially of enough. So we're thinking, okay, now if I exchange x and y, I know that for this, I'm counting something else. I'm counting fully simple maps. Could it be that uh, when I apply tr to the spectral curve with exchange x and y, and then the same B, because that's what all symplectic invariants work, the same Bergman kernel. So that was the conjecture, which we formulated precisely with um, in the thesis of uh, Elba Garcia Feilde. That should compute what I call omega GN check, which is, a, or XGN check, which is counting fully simple maps of any topology. And uh, the first thing is, what about the B? So the B should be related to omega zero two. And combinatorially, yes, this actually is true. So the fully simple cylinders, essentially the, the picture is, is like this. So you have two boundaries where they can touch each other. There's boundary one, there's boundary two, and they touch each other on these lines. And the maps is in the middle. So you can have this kind of touching and then you can have bubblings a bit everywhere here, everywhere. And when you express combinatorial leads, that give you com combinatorial leads that give you a relation between W02 and X02. Remove this check, which is exactly telling you that it's the same B. So when you do this shift and you express in terms of W variable in terms of X, you get the same. So it was a good evidence that yes, at the spectral curve level, uh, the realization of the X and Y exchange is exactly going from maps to fully simple maps. And then the conjecture was does that extend to all topology? And uh, this conjecture was resolved, so proved. And in fact, in two ways, one with um, Sebran Charbonnier um, and Elba Garcia Feilde, and about the same time uh, by the group of Okay, so I guess I, I close to how, how much time do I have? Is it three minutes or I don't hear anything? If you type in the chat, uh, I can see, <laughs> even if I don't hear. Okay, so make make big signs if I if I go over time and you want me to stop. Um, so. I just want to, to close a bit the circle. Um, I want to return because, in fact, maybe I can write things like it's fully simple maps with some boundary length, which I encode in a, in a partition lambda. Roughly speaking, you have a universal relation independently of which probability measure I take, which kind of k of faces I look at. So there is a universal relation. Okay, it's five minutes for any P. So fully simple maps are can be obtained from ordinary 
with a certain kernel here, which is exactly the weekly monotone Hurwitz numbers is just a certain width. Gamma is minus one over N. And here you need to put the normalizing factor. And you can also invert that, write it in the other way, ordinary maps. So if you disconnected maps, any topology, you count everything. Right here, mu. There's some symmetry factors in this relation, which I'm not writing here. And here it's in terms of the strictly monotone Hermes numbers. And there's um, at least three ways to see that. One is by Weingarten calculus. So that I, I didn't really explain why that would be true, but another way which may be more familiar to part of the audience, it comes from the character expansion of the HCIZ integral, which relates it to the monotone Hurwitz numbers. That's from the work of um, Gulden Gepake. I think you should be here. Okay. And Novak? Gito? Yes. Uh, the uh, HCIZ integral is for weekly uh, monotone. Yes. What is, is there also a matrix integral for the strongly monotone? So it means that you can go in one direction, but since these um, the operators in the Fox space that create these uh, weekly monotone or weekly monotone are inverse to each other up to a change of sign in the parameter. So once you know once, once you know one of these relations, you automatically know the other. These two matrices are somewhat inverse from each other. But is there a matrix model representation of the tau function? Mm. Oh, of this one, you mean? That I don't. That I don't know. Simple. Uh, so, uh, fully uh, monotone. Mm -hmm. And um, there's also a bijective proof. Good. So in. Uh, no, I need to conclude it in one minute. But what I want to say is that, so these are fully universal. And in fact, you can declare, you can study these kind of relations. So Z is a collection, is a, is a function on Young tableau, arbitrary function. And you can study relations of this form. Um, so for example, let's take this one. You sum Z, um, you check, okay. So that's an expression of, of this relation. But here uh, you start with a Z lambda here and you can define if or you start from Z mu check you and you define some Z lambda from this relation for any lambda. And that you can express in the Fox space. So you can actually encode, you can define a vector in the Fox space by those are the coefficient in terms of sure functions. And then the corresponding vector of the check is going to be a certain operator on the Fox space, which is exactly the one generating those weekly or strictly monotone Hurwitz numbers. So in the way I wrote it, Z is obtained by the certain operator generating the strictly monotone uh, on applied to the Z check. And then you can use operator methods to deduce with a lot of heavy computations that's using the method of Shadrin et al. To deduce actual functional relations between WGNs, which you define from, from Z in the same way that you would define, uh, you would go from disconnected to connected by taking a log, and then you extract a certain genus thing, so a certain coefficient of a, of a parameter N, and the WGN check, which you define in the same way, but from Z check. And if you specialize this relation to G equals zero, you in fact going to retrieve the relation between higher order free cumulants and uh, usual cumulants. And this type of function, so at the functional relations, so functional relations problem, and you also obtain it in higher genus as well. So that was not defined in free probability, but that also works. And this thing was uh, defined at the combinatorial level in a work by Collins, Mingo, Schniadi, and Speicher, but they couldn't prove more from their definition than these relations for the so the R transform in the second order. 
which is here expressed in the fact that that's the same B. And, and some of this method, which is this detour via Hurwitz numbers and the Fox space, uh, allowed actually to, to solve this, uh, this problem, which was open for, for a while. And there's even more recently some more better development. I mean, you can express generally what X and Y exchange is doing for an arbitrary spectral curve using the operator method. That's a recent paper of Shadrin et al. And so now we're much closer to actually prove or understand well this symplectic invariance property. And it's really this uh, interaction between different domains uh, was extremely fruitful and inspiring. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, I hope, can, can you hear us now? Yes. yes. Okay. Are there questions from the audience here or the audience in Zoom? There's a question now. Oh, all the way to the back, just a second. I have, can you hear me? Uh, yes. Yes, thank you very much for that. I have two questions. The first one is horrible. I apologize for it. So what is exactly topological relation, uh, recursion? Yes. <laughs> you want to ask also the second one and then I see- Yes, so the second one. Yes, you want to skip the first one. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm going to try to answer in a more- uh, The second one is, uh, since there are uses Murphy elements for other group algebras, is there something like Horowitz numbers, uh, not for type A, not for symmetric group? So there is, uh, in particular, recently the type B, so which was, I think, initially studied by, so I'm not exactly sure, I think Nathan Zone and then all of uh, studied, were maybe the first to study that, but please correct me if I'm wrong. So in this type B, you replay the symmetric group by uh, the Sergeyev group. And uh, that corresponds, in fact, it's interesting because it counts Hurwitz numbers with a, with a spin. So you have a spin structure on the cover and uh, you count the, the, the branch cover with a sign depending on the parity of the spin structure. And uh, so that you can do. Uh, the very start of my talk for the B, so it's, uh, it's well known, I think from this work of, uh, at least from Orlov, but maybe also some other people. Um, and uh, then the operator part and the treatment of this operator thing and how to get to top oracle recursion, that's also was done by uh, Alessandro Giacchetto, Danilo Levansky, Rainier Kramer. They conjectured the top oracle recursion for this. And uh, shortly after with the same technique, so this very flexible technique, um, Alexander van Chadrin, in fact, proved the conjecture. Um, so the answer, at least for type B, yes. Uh, most of this, I mean, most of the theory extends and it has very interesting applications in algebraic geometry. Um, now I should try to answer your first question. <laughs> in topological recursion, you start with a spectral curve. I don't want to, I don't want to make it long. I just want to say roughly what, what it does and what it looks like. Um, and so a spectral curve is just, if you want a complex curve, but you realize it as a branch cover, let's say of P1, and uh, you equip it with another function, let's say a meromorphic function. And there's a little piece of data, an extra one, which maybe I don't want to discuss too much, but you, you can, let me call it omega zero two. And out of this data, so there's this black box called topological recursion, which tell you consider omega zero one, which is y dx, that you want to see as a function of x, but secretly it's more a, it's more a meromorphic one form on the spectral curve. And omega zero two is part of the initial data. It depends on two points in the spectral curve. And then there's a formula that computes omega g n by a recursion on two g minus two plus n from these initial cases by, I mean, there's a residue formula, but it's by computing residues. You look at the sum of residues at zeros of dx, which are the ramification of this branch cover here, which has nothing to do with the branch cover I, I was counting here. This is a fixed curve with a fixed function x. And then there's some kernel that depends on the initial data. And here there's something which depend on, on the rest of the variables, 
which only involves omega g prime n prime for 2g prime minus 2 plus n prime smaller than 2g minus 2 plus n. So then this is a recursion. So I can add one sentence, but first I would like to ask, what is your background? <laughs> Oh, okay. sorry. She says that she is an algebraic, is not an algebraic geometrist. Okay, good. Um, so you may have heard of the Virasoro algebra. Yeah. Yes. Good. And um, so this, how this definition is made, is to solve, is to produce. So these things, all together, they give rise to a kind of a highest weight vector for uh, Virasoro several copies of the Arthur algebra and the central charge, the cell dual central charge. So it's if you want, there is some operators which are going to kill a generating series, which I call Z, which is a bit like the tau function actually. It encodes, the, so the tau encodes the information about all the omega GNs. And there's some operator that kill that. And it's only half of the, operator that kill it. So topological recursion is a solution of those Virasoro constraints, uh, which has a, in this context, a very specific form, which is universal and only depends on the spectral curve. And the reason why we're interested in that is because these omega gn, if you fix a certain spectral curve, like the one coming from Hubbard's counting problem, so the counting of disks, or if you take the spectral curve of an integrable system given by a lax pair, or if you take uh, the spectral curve of a matrix model encoding the way the eigenvalues behave in a larger uh, limit, the omega gen in this case is going to compute, uh, essentially to solve your problem um, completely by this induction. The only thing that changes in the initial is the input, which is the spectral curve. So in five minutes, uh, that's what I can say. Can you know, somebody? Thanks. 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 She's, she's thanking you, but uh, the microphone is a bit far, so I am relaying information. Any any other question or comment? John. Unless there's somebody else, I don't want to always take precedence. So get down. Uh, very nice talk. Thank you. Um, did I understand correctly that you said that if you know the uh, weekly uh, monotonic double Horvitz numbers, then you can somehow also calculate from that the weekly uh, monotonic ones. I say something a bit different. You consider these double Horvitz numbers as an infinite matrix whose rows and columns are indexed by partitions. And uh, I'm saying that if you know this relation, you can deduce the other. Just because these matrix, so it's the matrix. We don't see what you're writing. So no, no. Where, where is it? Here? Yeah, 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 it's okay. There's relation one and relation two. Oh, okay. And one of them implies the other just by the fact that these two matrices are inverse of each other. And this is clear on the Fox space formalism. Because when you express them, this is Murphy's, it's just. Uh, Either you put that or that. So up to changing the sign of gamma, when you multiply by the two together, you get the identity. So can you scroll? Can you scroll up again to, to the one and two? So yes. was that an inequality or an equality? That's no, that's, that's an equality. equality. So so you can read off these fully simple maps and also the ordinary maps from a knowledge of the uh, weighted Horvitz numbers. I'm saying there's a yes, if you know. That's maybe the best way to express it is this kind of way. So you have a vector. If you know one vector, this operator defined in terms of Hermit's numbers gets you to the other side, and that's invertible. And if you invert it, you actually get the weekly, the transition matrix given by the weekly monotone. And D is just D is just a li an infinite linear map. D is this uh, in the Fox space, it's exactly uh, my these two things here. Oh. Except I put gamma, okay, uh, gamma is maybe one over n in my case. Uh, it's the it's the weight generating function with Juicy's yeah. Murphy elements put in. Yes. Oh, okay. That's pretty explicit. 
Okay, thank you. Right. Okay, so other questions? Online, maybe? If, if not, we can thank the speaker again. Thank you very much. And now we have a break until 3.30 for...